discovery today, heels exacerbates the hips issue. So, note to self. Welcome <laughs> our small crowd to um, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church on this yet warm day of summer. Another warm day and then the bottom's going to fall out for a little while, which will probably feel kind of nice to us, right? 40s at night, 60s during the day, I'm really excited about that. Um, but just looking at announcements in our bulletin, note that there is a um, birthday celebration for Junior Elder's 100th birthday next Sunday, 1.30 to 3 o'clock, and that is at, is it at the, at where he lives, yes? First Baptist. No, at First Baptist, thank you, I get it, because I just wasn't reading further ahead. Um, and Aggie O'Neill's birthday is tomorrow. I knew she had really hoped to get here today, but I think her children are telling her no, no yet. Um, note also, Bob Bodenheimer has moved. He's, um, his daughter has told us that he's struggling right now and would love some cards. Um, and Jane, it's good to see you back. Glad to have you. Um, I don't think there are any other announcements this morning, so let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
as you are able for the conversion. Shout praise to God. Praise God. The music is great God looks upon us with favor. God rejoices in our loving and compassion for us. Thanks be to God who offers to us new life. Praise be to Jesus Christ who taught us how to live. Amen. to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ prays for us. My friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. <laughs> is from Romans, which is New Testament. 
And we've been reading from Romans. Paul wrote that book. It's a, it's a letter to the church in Rome. And today he's basically saying um, there's one thing that, one thing you can do that makes it so that you um, meet all of the laws. And by that he's thinking of the um, Ten Commandments. Okay? There's one thing you can do that, that meets all of the Ten Commandments of um, not, not wanting something of your neighbors, um, respecting your parents, um, not killing somebody, and there's all ten of them. Can you think of one, the one thing you can do that makes it so you fulfill all of the ten laws? One thing starts with L. Love. Yes. He says love. Love is the answer and, and covers all of the Ten Commandments. Makes it so that you follow all the laws. Is love. Loving your neighbor. Because if you love your neighbor, you will not break any of the laws of the Ten Commandments. That's pretty nifty, right? We don't have to worry about all ten of those things. All we have to do is remember to love our neighbor. And that's what Paul had to say. And that's pretty much what Jesus had to say because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And that took care of everything as far as Jesus was concerned too. So it's pretty cool that that's all we have to do. We don't have to worry about all those little laws in the Old Testament. Um, sadly, I'm going to just say, it's really hard to do sometimes, right? Sometimes you guys don't love each other very much. <laughs> Actually, you love each other, you just don't like each other. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, help us. Help us every day, every moment of every day to remember to love. In Jesus' name we pray.
absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Our scripture lesson today comes from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I know I do this a lot, taking us back to high school, but we're going to go back to high school again for a moment. My children are in high school, and every day I say, how is that possible? But maybe there's a lot you'd like to forget about your high school years, like peer pressure, the clothes you were wearing then, and the hair, and gym class. <laughs> One thing about which high school grads agree is that the textbooks contain some of the most boring, mundane, and sometimes baffling statements you've ever read in your life. If you've ever spent a part of a test trying to figure out why anyone would care, much less notice, that a train traveling 25 miles an hour from Poughkeepsie passes another train from Peoria going 35 miles an hour in the opposite direction somewhere in the middle of nowhere, then you know what I'm talking about. If you felt inadequate at doing word problems back then, it could be that you weren't really adept at math, or perhaps it was actually the fault of the textbook writer. Unclear, blooperish, and nonsensical questions sometimes appeared in those 40-pound books that you lugged back and forth to class, which could explain that C you received in algebra back in the day. A website called Thanks Textbooks now offers a fascinating look at the myriad ways in which educational writing can make students actually more confused and proficient. The site lists dozens of textbook fails and head scratchers from around the world, enough to make even the most challenged student feel like a genius by comparison. It's almost as, the, as those textbook writers live in a different world than that inhabited by the rest of us, a world where someone gets random condiments on a burger, where eating 27 pieces of pizza is normal, and where someone actually contemplates the weight of his or her favorite orange. It's no wonder that most students look at this stuff and exclaim, I'll never use this. You may not remember the last time you played a game with complex numbers, if ever, but there are certain pieces of information that are both useful and necessary to your daily life. That's especially true when it comes to the Christian life. For that, we do need clear directions with practical applications in order to deal with real world problems. Fortunately for us, the Apostle Paul gives us Romans, which we might consider a textbook for the Christian life. Paul wasn't simply dreaming up problems for his churches to solve. Indeed, 
Paul often answered questions that the people of the first century world didn't know they needed to ask. Romans itself isn't the easiest book to read and understand with its paragraph long and sentences and lengthy arguments, but it does offer some of the most practical and useful advice for living in a world where things often don't make sense. In particular, chapters 12 through 16 give some practical ideas for living out the theology and worldview that Paul gives us in chapters 1 through 11. As part of that section, the clarity of Paul's instruction here in the pericope we read, 13, 8 through 14, offers the answer key, if you will, to a whole lot of problems in living the life of Christ in the world. For Paul, as it was for Jesus, the primary answer to any problem one might encounter is love. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The law Paul points to here is the commandments from Exodus 20. Ten clear statements from the biblical textbook about the way life is to be lived in the community of God's people. But like any word problem, star staring at these Ten Commandments for a long period of time can lead to looking for loopholes or alternative interpretations, right? That's why Paul reveals the basis behind the commandments as the guiding principle for answering most every question and every test the Christian might encounter. The commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul echoes Jesus here, who preached that the greatest commandments are the, are the love of God and neighbor. On these two commandments, said Jesus, hang all the laws and the prophets. Whatever the question might be for Christian behavior, be it about eating, playing games, relationships, engagement with the world, about being the church, or even running away from elephants, the answer is love. That's not an easy answer, though, especially when Jesus told us to love even our enemies. Paul writes to the church in Rome, which was struggling under the thumb of the emperor. The Roman world would be hostile to Christians for about 300 years, but even then, Paul says that the answer to the questions on the civics test is love and respect. Pay to all what is due them, says Paul. Taxes to who taxes are due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. Even when confronted with the power and injustice of the world, the Christian's answer must be love. It's not a squishy, meek kind of love that Paul is calling for, nor is it quantitative like another textbook question that asked the ratio of hugs to kisses at the family reunion was 4 to 1. If there were 148 hugs, how many kisses were there? The answer, by the way, is 37, but I'm going to guess much less than that if Aunt Edna is there with her garlic breath, right? Rather, the kind of love that Paul's talking about is the love that forgives rather than retaliates, that promotes peace instead of conflict. In fact, says the apostle, we need this shorthand because answer of love for most questions because the test time is running out. Besides this, says Paul, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far, far gone, the day is near. Like a student who's watching the clock while taking the SAT, Paul sees that the time is nearly up for the present world. The day of the Lord, the eschaton, is close at hand. The day when every person will be graded on their deeds. 
And so Paul says it's time to stop trying to parse the questions and get busy checking the most important boxes. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in the reveling and darkness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. In other words, live now as though you've already passed the test. Students who envision themselves being successful and who put extra time into study tend not to be surprised when odd or anomalous questions appear on a test. Paul invites us to engage in good habits that lead to success, in contrast to lazy and licentious students who will flunk the ultimate final. This is Paul's textbook advice to those of us who are confronted with strange questions and conundrums every day. What's the right answer when your boss treats you unfairly? What's the proper response when your friend gets the scholarship you thought you deserved? What box do you check when you have to send in your taxes? How do you deal with a nasty neighbor who lets his dog poop on your own yard or doesn't mow that little strip of lawn? What do you do about the fact that there are just so many people you don't like? What do you do with a problem in one of your current relationships? How do you handle a problem with your finances or your career? How do you respond to a problem with one of your family members? Do you have a problem with self-esteem, self-acceptance, appearance, or health? No easy answers, but they begin with love. Unconditional, willful, sacrificial, Christ-like love. In the end, it's the answer to everything. Amen. rise as we are able, as we hear, I love thy kingdom, Lord, number three.
requests. Um, first one is from Francine. Um, her sister Marlene is having heart issues, and her brother Russ is recovering from a heart attack. Um, Mary, as Francine has said, is having hip pain, um, as am I, and um, saw an orthopedic surgeon um, last week, and they referred me to eight weeks of physical therapy. <laughs> um, I started last week, and I have three appointments this coming week. Hmm. Also, as many of you are probably aware, um, please keep the semen community in your prayers. Um, it's been a very rough week, and um, a very difficult sermon for me to preach today based on what it has happened in the semen community. Um, so those are our prayer concerns for today. Let us join together at the table. Lord's table, and he invites all those who accept him as his Lord, as your Lord and Savior, to take part in this joyful feast. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give. Our, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. Almighty God, we praise you for all who labor for the common good and for those whose service is unappreciated. We thank you for children whose play is the work of learning to live in the world. We thank you for our disciples who are obedient to the promptings of your spirit in all their relationships. We thank you for your yearning mercy that waits for us to make all our hours and days participation in your healing and blessing of the earth and all peoples. You made us in your image and set us in a lush garden as caretakers. When we choose to have it all to ourselves, you turned our freedom to the toil for survival. When we cried out in our misery, you delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. By the prophets, you called us to return to you and delight in good food without price. You confronted us with the waste of laboring apart from you, and you asked us, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Above all, we give you thanks and blessings in your Son, Jesus Christ, Anointed with your spirit, his food was to do your will and to complete it. He took the common things of daily life, blessed them and broke them and shared them so that all were satisfied. He told those who followed him, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. He confronted the powers of greed and evil at the cost of his life, but you triumphed over death and placed him at your right hand to intercede for his disciples until the feast of eternal life. By water and the Spirit, he calls us to continue his work until we and all peoples feast at his heavenly banquet. And so, in the remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to live daily as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. We pour ourselves out to you and to the Holy Spirit, and we ask your blessings and your love and your 
intercessions on all those we have listed, lifted up here today and to all those others that we name now in silence. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer that we were taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood, sealed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the risen Lord until he comes again. The gifts of God to the people of God. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. And all God's people said. Amen.